I want to just sort of ease us into that so that we can take it all in. I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed by what's about to happen. Um, I pared this talk down a lot to kind of make it, um, well, just kind of to make it as easy as possible. So I just cut out a lot of the more technical stuff. So just to hit these really nice bullet points tonight, um, just a quick preface to this talk. Um, I, I've been doing this series of last Friday of the month, visual presentations of things on Buddhism. And uh, the idea is, is that uh, like one of them was on Buddhist iconography. One of them was on the Buddhist monastic robes. And they all actually kind of have some map slides in there. And I'm always sort of not sneaking in, but I kind of have to teach a little bit of geography and a little bit of history in order to contextualize certain changes, whether they're in the monastic robes or whether they're in, the, in the art and iconography. Well, tonight's talk is sort of just the geography, just the tr uh, transitions of Buddhism out of India to the rest of the world, kind of. Um, and so in that way, it might seem like it's a little dry. I mean, the geography, I like, ge I think geography is super cool. And so tonight we're going to have a lot of fun with geography. Um, as a lot of people know, I'm kind of critical in a certain sense, as far as when it, my approach to history, my approach to geography is going to be a little kind of critical in that way. So I'll kind of walk you through, oh, just some things that I'm doing that are a little unique to my approach to understanding, uh, history and geography. Um, as usual, I think I'm going to have the normal kind of uh, low points at which I'll ask for questions. So uh, during this sort of presentation period, uh, if you can just hold off and just take notes of the question you have. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. Um, again, this is it. This is going to be the history of Buddhism, or at least the geography of it. And here we go. So to start off, since it's a geography show, we're going to be using a map. And years and years and years ago, when I first put this talk together, I chose the, the most out of date, jankiest, like elementary school map, because, you know, like I started to say a moment ago, my approach to this is all a little critical. And so projections, i.e. maps, you know, they're so political, they're so problem problematic in that way. So I thought, why not start with one that's very, uh, you know, old school that way to just point out all the problems. Um, I'm not even going to try to pretend. Um, but in order to make this a little easier, I am going to, I did this getting rid of all of the modern names for these places, um, what we would call nations or countries. And I'm also sort of here respecting their geo. Uh, like topographical geographical boundaries because a lot of these boundaries are based on sometimes natural borders and things like that but even just to make this a little more decontextualized call it apolitical or as apolitical as possible we're just going to kind of go with this blank <laughs> you know now we've got some continents right we got some land masses and continents that i can work with now, unfortunately, as far as these things go, we are, or I will be for convenience sake, uh, I'm gonna be relying on a pretty standard time system. So that's gonna be our kind of BC time BC time AD, and both this idea of BC and AD somehow mysteriously revolving around this year zero that doesn't exist. Again, it's a sl just a little critical note that I like to point out that we have a very odd uh, chronology, as it would be called, a very odd sort of timekeeping system where our time, our sense of time moves backwards and forwards. But from this point in history, 2000 years ago, 2020 years ago, um, not backwards and forwards from our present moment, right? So that's just like slightly interesting. So we could think of all of these events taking place sort of 2000 or actually as we get into this 2500 years ago so i'm going to be using the timeline up at top to keep track of some events and that way actually i think this is helpful as we move along because we're going to go through it all folks all 2000 you know 520 years of history here and so having that timeline to remind us, oh yeah, that's when this started. Oh yeah, that's when these developments happened. I think that would be nice. 
uh, I'm going to be using some pretty standard, um, uh, you know, or broad uh, geographies here. We're talking about northeastern subcontinent of what is today India. Uh, at the time that we're talking about, 500 BC, almost actually 600 BC, the region of space where we're talking about it was called Magadha in modern Bihar, India, of course. And we're going to be talking, of course, about Siddhartha Gautama. This is the, the Buddha. The Buddha is a title. There were many Buddhas or various people that were called enlightened ones. So sometimes to differentiate this particular Buddha, he's called the Gautama Buddha. He's also sometimes referred to as Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakya clan. Now, because this is about geography, I'm not going to get too into this, but I do want to focus on some geographical points. So the Buddha was, uh, this is all story, by the way, is we're, we're way before uh, recorded history here, or at least re Buddhist recorded history. We're, you know, relying on lore here. But the lore is, is that the Buddha was born in Lumbini, which was a garden or a kind of a forested area in what is actually today Nepal. And this is just a cartoonish image of him renouncing, cutting off his hair after he saw the sights of old age, sickness, death, and renunciation. And then that led him to wander the forest, study with great masters. This is all part of other lectures I do, so I'm not doing it tonight. But the basic idea, of course, is that he overcomes greed, hatred, and delusion, desire, all these things, um, and becomes an enlightened being. Uh, this is at about the age 35, and where this happened was in Bodhgaya, which is today the Gaya district, also in Bihar. And of course, after that, he found these uh, five renunciants, uh, bhikshus, or bhikkhus, and this is the turning of the wheel at Sarnath, otherwise known as the Deer Park, that's in modern-day uh, Varanasi. Um, and so these spots, Lumbini Garden, Bodhgaya, Sarnath, where he turned the wheel and taught for the first time. Um, and then finally, Kushinigara. These four are kind of the four holy sites of Buddhism in India uh, or, you know, around the area where he taught. And so this is him, uh, the, the Buddha in Parinirvana, kind of passing away, dying, if you will, uh, between the twin Sala trees. All right. So again, I'm just using these kind of cartoon images to evoke ideas of what you probably already know about Buddhism. This is not a Dharma class. It's not a philosophy class. We're not going to be talking about that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about history. And so the idea is, is like, okay, the Buddha enlightened all of that. But how do we know that? How do we know all this really happened fi at around 500 BC? Well, this is where I'm going to start a theme in the lecture tonight or the, the, this talk tonight, which is connecting the spread of Buddhism to certain uh, either uh, like kings, rulers, dynasties, empires, things like that. And so our first connection is to uh, the king of Magadha at the time the Buddha was born named Bimbisara. Those are his roughly his dates that we know about. And Bimbisara appears in Buddhist sutras. And more importantly, son of Bimbisara, Ajatasattu, and who was the kind of um, the dynastic head of the Haryanka dynasty in Magadha, in that region that's highlighted on the map there. Again, that rain period is a rough rain period for Ajatasattu that overlaps with the lifetime of the Buddha. And again, Ajatasattu appears in many Buddhist sutras. And so there's a corroboration of history going on between the dynastic histories that we know of, the Indian dynastic histories that we know of that include Ajatasattu, and then these Buddhist stories that talk about Ajatasattu. So that's how we are sort of dating a lot of these things, just so that you know. And it was during the reign of Ajatasattu that the Buddha died, entered to Parinirvana, and there was the first council. This was traditionally three months, I believe, after the Buddha died. But again, we're sort of in some, you know, really old period of time here. So it's still kind of lore, folklore, mythology with a, a bit of history in that way. But supposedly at the capital of Magadha, Rajgir, in 483, 
uh, BC. This is the sort of traditional date. The 500 senior disciples, arhats of the Buddha got together and they decided, sorry, uh, or they compiled the Vinaya, the, all of the things the Buddha said regarding the monastic code. And this idea of a Vinaya or a monastic code is going to pop up a lot tonight. So I, I need to introduce it to you now. As will this collection of teachings, the sutras. We talk about sutras all the time. In my classes, we focus mainly on sutras. And so what the sutras were, what did the Buddha say? What are the teachings? That was decided at the first council. And then also this idea of these systems or Abhidharma, kind of more technical teachings. And it actually has a lot to do with systems systems for teaching, systems for understanding, lists, things like that. Abhidharma and how we systematize the teachings, that's going to come up a lot too. So this initial division of the teachings into these three, the monastic code, sort of the gospels, if you will, the stories and teachings of the Buddha, and then the sort of um, how to understand it. These three baskets, the Tripitaka got put together at the first council. Uh, and we are to understand that there was no disagreement about anything at this point. That, that will become relevant as we move ahead in time. So you move ahead in time, and of course, Buddhism spreads outside of that initial region there of, uh, of Magadha, starts to spread up into what will become Nepal, spreads into central India, spreads even a little over into what is like Bangladesh, right? And that spread goes to, gets us to about 400 BC moving right along. And as we move into what would be the fourth century BC, we have the rise of something new, or at least we have a, some schism or, or divisions going on in Buddhism. And that division culminates in the second council that was held in Vaishali. And if you've been taking my, uh, the Vimalakirti course with me and Michael Taft, interesting that this initial division in Buddhism essentially between a kind of early Mahayana and a kind of what will become a Theravada tradition happens in Vaishali. In 383 BC, about a hundred years after the Buddha uh, died, right? And this initial split was between two, it's, it's hard, you don't even really want to think of them as schools or sects or anything like that quite yet. But the Maha Samgikas, and the name means the Maha Sangha, the big Sangha, they were sort of, at least according to records of, of some schools, they were the more populist, popular, broadly inclusive Sangha. Whereas the Staviravada, a school unto itself, whose name does have, etymologically, it has to do with the Theras, the Theravada, what would become the Theravada, because it's referring to the elders. And there's another name for the Stavira Vada, which is actually the Stavira Nikaya. And the Nikaya is the group of sutras, the collection of sutras in particular. And the, the, the elders, the Theras, they seem to have wanted to cut off the canon, meaning the collection of all the sutras. They were kind of like, no, 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 this is it. This is what we said he said. <laughs> No more, no, we're not getting wild out there with some new additions to this. This is what he said. And so there's a sense at which the Staviravadins were kind of conservative, preserving kind of an early established tradition, whereas the Mahasamgikas seem to have been open to some changes in development moving along, right? So that kind of creates this initial schism in Buddhism, this second council. And what I'm going to do on my map here is show you this schism that the Maha Samgika has sort of maintained. I don't want to say control because, again, it, the schisms here are not as – nobody was taking up stick and sword against each other here. It was really about, okay, you go your way. We're going to go our way. <laughs> we've got our group of teachings. We've got the color robes that we wear. We've got our tradition. We're going to go do our thing. You go do your thing. So it was a little more amical than it might seem. Uh, we're so used to religious schisms being violent in that way. We can't imagine the, this. But what I've done here in my map, though, is that I've gotten rid of that initial 
kind of white, call it magnolia circle. Whatever happened at the time of the Buddha, whatever happened in 500 BC, well, the Mahasamgika say it was this, and the Staviravadans say it was this. And so there's a way in which well, we, that's lost now. Even 100 years after the Buddha, whatever it was, we now have two representatives saying, this is what he said. No, no, this is what he said. Or at least this was the spirit of the law. No, this was the spirit of the law. And so this division happens with the Staviravadans sort of heading south. Um, we're going to pick up on that in a minute. Uh, but I'm moving us ahead in time. If you noticed our little timeline, ooched ahead there. And now as we get into the, the kind of the middle of the fourth century BC, the Mahasamgikas sort of took over India. And I don't mean to say that the Staviravada tradition wasn't active in other parts. They weren't just a tiny pocket. But my map here is to indicate that the Mahasamgikas were top to bottom, north, east, north, south, east, west, all 10 directions. The Mahasamgikas were very active, very popular. Again, they were kind of just very popular Buddhism in that way. Um, in many accounts, it seems that they included the laity into their idea of the Sangha, whereas the Staviravadins only included the monastics, the monks and the nuns, whereas the laity were not part of the Sangha. That may have been the etymology of the Mahasamgikas. The Mahasangha was that it was both uh, renunciants and laity. But again, this is still so old in time and history, we don't really have a lot to go on. Um, but as we move along, another thing uh, emerges about this time. We're going to put it on the map. This is the emergence of a new school or a new sect called the Sarvastivada. And insofar as this map is indicative of the actual colors of robes that Buddhist monks wore, these three sort of colors on the map right here, the more yellow, the more turmeric -y brown, yellow, and then our, our deep red maroon, these do actually represent the Vinayas of three groups, the Mahasamgikas, the Staviravadan, and the Sarvastivadans, and they, Sarvastivadans, wore maroon robes. Mahasamgikas wore yellow robes, and the Staviravadans were not exactly sure, but they're later uh, uh, the later schools that picked up that tradition w w wear this kind of turmeric brown and so I just want you to see that these colors are sort of active and eventually this Sarvastivada which by the way that name means all exists and they were the Sarvastivadans were I mean, it's hard to explain that all three of these groups the Sarvastivadans the Staviravadans and the Mahasamgikas by all accounts, they would all appear to be much more renunciant and like hardcore than even a lot of Buddhists today. I want to stress this, that these, these groups still seem to have been very hardcore in the renunciation uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, poverty and things like that. So I just want to make clear that these are, all three of these would look like hardcore Buddhists to us but they differentiated themselves based on some philosophical ideas, such as the Sarvastivadins, who sort of believed or understood all time as existing at once, the past, the present, and the future. And so all existed at once, we just perceive ourselves at a particular moment. The other schools seem to have had, no, no, the past is, is the past, it's gone. The future isn't even here yet there's sort of a sense in which there's a present that is the culmination of the past and is the creator of the future, but is its own kind of thing. Anyways, again, I'm not getting into the Dharma of it all. Just want you to know that there was this group that, again, they may have gone way back, but their first, in, you know, historical references are in this kind of mid fourth century BC time. All right. Moving ahead, the Staviravada and start to move south. And as they move south, that group starts to be known as Vibhajyayavada, pardon my terrible Sanskrit, the word of, that means divided teachings. And actually, this is not a school. The, and I say this is early Theravada still because we're not at what would be known as Theravada yet, not by a long shot. 
where we are is at a point where there was the Sarvastivadins, and then there were all these other groups that popped up. What would become the Theravadins in southern India that had migrated down there, but there was also a group over in the west called the Pudgalavadins, and they were an odd group because they kind of believed in a self. <laughs> And if you've studied a lot of Dharma and Buddhism with me or anybody, you know, Buddhism's kind of preaching this idea of no self. So they were an interesting group. They're included among these Vibhajayavadins, right? The just uh, different teachings. And in the sort of north, even further north than uh, where we've been, a group known as the Dharma Guptikas. Now they came out of a different group. I'm, this is where I decided to jettison a lot of slides and just cut to what's important. But the Dharma Guptikas were known to wear either dark blue, like their predecessors, the Mahishasakas, or they wore black, okay? So those are those groups. And these are the major groups of Buddhism at this time. Traditionally, this time period is known as the time period of the 18 schools. The dots that I have on the map right now sometimes get subdivided into smaller sects. And there are other schools I haven't even mentioned. And it's mainly because I'm only trying to track what brings us, what, what makes it into the modern era. So we're going to have to unfortunately let go a lot of the early stuff. I do a whole talk on the early schools of Buddhism. So stay tuned for that. This brings us to our next kind of uh, uh, ruler type person. This is Emperor Ashoka, Ashoka the Great. He sort of established this Mauryan dynasty. And the Mauryan dynasty is like India as we know it. Ashoka is sort of known for having unified India, unified what was once a bunch of little countries and nations and all of that. And this was basically about 300 BC, moving into the third century BC. Ashoka is always important because uh, it's from these pillars that he established all throughout India. This is an Ashokan pillar, pillar that still survives. On these pillars, carved into stone at the base, they talk about Ashoka supporting the Dharma, supporting the Sangha, supporting the Buddha. And so, one of the things I want to make clear is that. Ajatasattu, he didn't, he wasn't a Buddhist per se. There's actually an interesting exchange where the Buddha tries to convince him to come on board and he doesn't do it. But Ajatasattu supported Buddhism and it allowed for all the 18 sects to develop essentially. Ashoka is kind of the same thing where it's like there's a debate about whether he was Buddhist or not, but he supported Buddhism. And the fact that this ruler of all of India supported Buddhism, it's what really allows it to start transcending the, the geography of the subcontinent there, right? It was under Ashoka, or at least traditionally, this is again a little bit debated, but it's traditionally under Ashoka that at a place called a, a Pataliputra, Ashoka called a third council to get this straight. <laughs> There's all these 18 sects, 18 schools, different colored robes, all this stuff going on. And so there was a third council called, and this was a schism or a debate between that Sarvastivadin group wearing their maroon robes and then all the other schools. Okay, so this was, it's kind of hard to, you know, get into the specifics of it because it's not exactly one group going against another. It's kind of much more of a fracturing of Buddhism in that way. But again, I just want you to take a look at the timeline and recognize, wow, we're really only a few hundred years out of the gate here. And Buddhism's already splintering into all these different groups. And it's getting really hard to, well, it's definitely getting hard to put a finger on what Buddhism really is or was, you know. And so if you're concerned about that, sorry, probably never going to figure that out. Um, but if you're kind of open to the idea that you could triangulate meaning based on, oh, if, this, if these people are saying this and these people are saying that and these people are saying that, maybe the truth is somehow in there. Well, then it's great that we have all these different teachings, right? So this is now we're moving way ahead, right? We've jumped several centuries because basically this is the landscape of the subcontinent, what will be called India, for the next cent few centuries, all right? 
and basically coming into what would be called the uh, common era. I'm going to stick with the AD, Anu Domini dating. It is, uh, oh, sorry, it's during this time, during these three centuries, that Buddhism, the Staviravada, the Vibhajayavadan type group that was in the south of India, they jump over to Sri Lanka. When exactly this happens, you know, not, um, it really depends on what sources you're using, but it happened within these few centuries that uh, actually some people say it was during Ashoka, that Ashoka brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. So you could take it as far back as 250 BC. But it was, again, we're still not even at Theravada yet. This is just the southern group of differentiated teaching that made its way to Sri Lanka. The Pudgalavadins, they disappear. That group, that type, and meant, there are many, many, many schools, again, that I didn't mention, of which I'm kind of just using the Pudgalavadins as, an, uh, uh, to, as a placeholder. Many of these start to sort of disappear in this time period, all right? The Sarvastivadins, take, they take hold in what is today Nepal. So Nepalese Buddhism, as we'll see in a number of slides, is a kind of a Sarvastivadin, actually take on a Mula Sarvastivadin Vinaya, as it's called. About what's, well, let, actually, let me finish this up. So the, the Dharmagupta group that was in the north, they, sorry, that was uh, for the Sarvastivadins taking over Nepal. The Dharmaguptikas take over what is today Pakistan and eventually what is today Afghanistan. This is all a region called Gandhara at the time, modern Pakistan, Afghanistan. And they're using this Dharmaguptika Vinaya, which is again, why they wear that color robe. And they have their own philosophy. In many ways, if, if you're curious and you're wondering at this point um, about like Mahayana Buddhism, well, Mahayana Buddhism is definitely forming in this BC era. But I want you to know that the Sarvastivadins in Nepal with the maroon robes, they're very Mahayana. They definitely are believing in kind of other Buddhas, um, definitely kind of having a wild idea about the Buddha body and all of that. Dharmaguptikas are also very Mahayana. Uh, in fact, there's sort of a subgroup of that Dharmaguptika type Buddhism where they believe the Buddha was an alien, straight up from a whole other planet, not human at all. Um, that's just sort of a subgroup, but it's to give you a taste or a flavor for this is a kind of a, a, a very Mahayana type Buddhism that was taking off in the north, both Gandhara and Nepal. Uh, Gandhara, of course, brings us into the modern era, into the common era, as it's called, the first century AD, first century common era. And this gets us to Kanishka, another, this is going to be right in line after Ashoka, major world ruler, the Kush Valley. Hindu Kush, that area, that Kushan area was an empire, and Kanishka the first was the ruler of that area. He kind of founded the Kushan Empire. 127 to 150 are the kind of general dates that are given. And that's the, the, the Kush Valley there. And this, of course, is a famous coin. It's a gold coin. That's Kanishka, the king of kings, as he was called. He's got a lamp in his right hand a staff. He's holding a staff in his left hand. He has this kind of triangular skirt, kind of triangular um, uh, bottom that is sort of like iconic for Kanishka, that when you see images of him, he always has this kind of triangular skirt. Um, and what's, of course, the most interesting thing about this coin is that when you turn it over, you have the what is considered the oldest image or known image of a Buddha. In fact, it says in Greek script, Budo, Buddha. So we have no, nobody denies that that's a Buddha with the head halo, body halo, doing the mudra of fearlessness. And so Kanishka was a supporter of Buddhism. But like Ashoka and like a Jatisattu, Kanishka, I mean, he, su he supported Buddha, of course. He put him on his coin. But you should know that Kanishka put Apollo on a coin, Hercules. You know, he put a lot of people on coins with him on the other side. And so to say he was Buddhist is like, well, I don't know, but he definitely supported Buddhism. And so if you've taken or you sat through uh, my talk, uh, Land of the Buddhas, I get in all the Buddhist art. 
and this is sort of some of the earliest images of the Buddha that we are familiar with, with the, the hair top knot, long earlobes, all of that. Um, so this, that's where this talk sort of ties in with that talk. And it's that type of Buddhism, the Dharma Guptaka based Mahayana style, very artistic type of Buddhism that sweeps through Central Asia and, and enters into what would be today called China. Um, at that time, it was by no means China. It was the Han dynasty, the Han people. This is a major dynasty, of course, in world history, stretching back to about 200 BC. In lasts for about 400 years into 200, lasts to about 220 of the common era. And it's basically around, I think, traditionally the year 50, 50, that Buddhism first appeared in China or in the Han Dynasty, where the, um, I forget the uh, emperor's name. He was an emperor of the Han. It's kind of like there's so many emperors of the Han Dynasty. I forget exactly which one, so I'm not going to give him his, his, uh, his kudos there, but it was an emperor who in a way had heard about a golden-faced uh, a man. He supposedly had a dream of a golden-faced man. Did he see a coin? Did, did somebody show him the Kanishka coin? Uh, but he said, some people said, let's find out about this golden-faced guy that everybody's talking about. And this was the first reports of Buddhism back. And by the map there, what I want to kind of get across is that the type of Buddhism that was entering the Han, that was entering China at this time, it was mostly Dharma Guptaka based because of where it was coming from, the Kush Valley. But I want you to know that the Sarvastivadin tradition was very popular, even outside of Nepal. I should, in a way, have little red dots all over India. I should even have a red dot down in Sri Lanka. I, ha I should have red, dot red dots in Gandhara. I don't want to confuse you too much, so I'm trying to locate these things a little more chunky geographically. But the kind of classic Theravadan type of renunciation, wear three robes, four noble truths, the Dharma that's like the orange band at the bottom, that came in, that's foundational. Sarvastivadin stuff, that came in for sure. And then the Dharma Guptika Vinaya came in. So I'm just kind of trying to again, in really chunky, blocky ch uh, ways, get across what's going on here. Just to note too, if anybody's wondering, well, is that Sarvasti Vaden band of red? Is that coming from Nepal? No, this is my really quick uh, Himalayan mountain range that is separating Nepal from the a Asia in that way. <laughs> and so it's gonna take many, many hundreds of years uh, I, you, we're going to get there and you'll be like, wow, it took that long. Yeah. It takes that long for Buddhism to creep up the foothills of the Himalayas and eventually over into the Tibetan plateau. All right. So I just want you to know that, that that's blocking that. And so Buddhism is either going North through the Khyber pass, as it's called through the Kush Valley into central Asia, or it's heading down, down South to Sri Lanka. Right. Boom. Again, just to make this very, very easy, within uh, decades, all of what is today China knew about and was into Buddhism. And the type of Buddhism they were being exposed to was a Gandharan style, Dharma Gupta Vinaya based type of Buddhism. Okay. This is going to be very important for a little bit later on down in the talk. All right. So, Again, I could have a bunch of different colored dots going on there, but it's helpful to know that China at this point was like, wait, what's all this about? And just sort of trying to figure it out. This is going to move us ahead to about 400 AD. Um, over this period, so from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century AD, Common Era, that is, it seems, Archaeologically, it seems that that's when Buddhism jumps off the little Sri Lanka and starts to head over to Indonesia, from Indonesia up into parts of what is today Malaysia, of course, into Thailand, Burma, otherwise known as Myanmar, Cambodia, and finally Laos. 
this is all, you know, I'm doing a gross injustice to history here in terms of how fast this is moving and it's much more complicated, but that's the general layout of the land there. As we're looking at 400 AD. All right, folks, we're, oh yeah, I want to include a, a few more like just images here, the type of Buddhism that's being practiced in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, very solitary renunciatory path, the, the forest tradition, going off foot of a tree and meditating, wandering the earth, three robes, real simple style Buddhist renunciation. It's what, what's going on in Southeast Asia, right? So they're holding down that kind of old school Buddhist renunciation. Um, just wanted to know that. And that basically at this point, of course, 400 AD, this is what the Buddhist world looked like. This is where Buddhism had reached. And this is the whole uh, reason why I wanted to do, or why I do the, the presentation this way with the timeline, is that if at any given point you could say, oh, that's, those are the places that knew about Buddhism at 400 AD, right? So we're pretty much, we're getting close to everywhere that we know about, but we still have quite a ways to go. Now we get into a, so I put a, my purple mark at about just after 400 AD. That dot is the capital of the, um, at that point, I guess, not even the Sui dynasty. So, you know, the succession of Chinese dynasties is another series of slides you were spared <laughs> that I took out. But the idea here is, is that the capital of China was sitting right where that purple dot is. Chang'an, as it was called, or Xi'an, as it's called today. That was the, the capital of, of, of China. And so it was the, the epicenter of East Asian Buddhism. And at that place uh, arrived a translator monk from Central Asia, a place called Kucha, a guy named Kumara Jiva. These are his dates, the dates that he lived. He's from Kucha, which is this area of Central Asia. One of, Kucha was one of many, many uh, small Buddhist kingdoms, of, of which there were many. Um, and basically, a long story short, China, or at least the dynasty that was at that dot, they conquered that region of Central Asia, and they found this monk who spoke like every language. He learned Chinese like basically overnight. The, they got uh, uh, conquered. And so in order to make friends with his new uh, uh, occupiers, he learned uh, Chinese really quick. And word got back to the emperor of China, of the dynasty, that, hey, we got this monk here. He speaks every language, including our own. He knows everything about Buddhism. So this is a statue, kind of a more... Um, well, we don't know what he really looked like, but there are reports that he was quite handsome. Um, but he, Kumara Jiva is important for the story because it's at this, he's a translator. So he's very famous for translating all of these Buddhist sutras. This one, like the Diamond Sutra, the Lotus Sutra. He translated all these into Chinese and not that they hadn't been translated before, but he's the first person to do it well where they could really understand like, oh, that's what the Buddha is saying? Whoa, well then let's get the gold and let's get the silver and let's get the indigo paper out. and Let's put this on, you know, in gold on indigo paper. So Kumara Jiva should really be given the credit for, you know, popularizing Buddhism, you know, in a really cultural way. And the thing about him that's important to know so actually, I'm going to try to back up real quick. Apologies for this. I just want you to be looking here. So when Kumara Jiva arrives at the capital of what is today China, look how much history, how, how much Buddhist history has passed. Look at all those colors. Look at those bars. Look at all that, right? So the Chinese got all of that at once. Remember, I told you about 50 AD is when Buddhism enters China. So that's 500 years of growth, development, change, 18 schools, splits and schisms and this and that. 
And so when Buddhism entered China, they were like, what is this? How do we make sense of all of this? And so through the translation projects of Kumar Jiva, he taught a system for understanding Buddhism that divided the Buddha's teaching into five periods. Now, this is something you do not see in India. They don't talk about this in India because in a way, the Indian historical records, they, they knew what, or they had their idea of what the Buddha taught when he taught it. But the, the Chinese were getting all of these wild sutras like the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Inconceivable Liberation Sutra. And so what Kumar Jiva did, or at least what he reported, I don't think he made it up. I think he was uh, reporting a system that was already established at his time was the story is, is that the Buddha became enlightened, if you remember that slide under the Bodhi tree of him defeating Mara and all of that. He supposedly spent three weeks, 21 days, fixed at, underneath the Bodhi tree in, in a trance, in the inconceivable liberation, actually, chanting the, Lod or, sorry, chanting the Avatamsaka Sutra for the gods, for whoever could hear it. And apparently nobody could understand it except for the gods and all of that. And so when the Buddha went to Sarnath to the deer park, he supposedly backed it all the way up and spent 12 years easing everybody in with the Four Noble Truths, the Five Skandhas, all the basic teachings of what are called the Nikaya schools or in Chinese, Chinese Nikaya is Agama. Same thing, it's these early collections of suttas, what would be called the, uh, the Pali suttas, the Pali canon. Well, supposedly that's just the first 12 years of the Buddha's teaching career. Then he kicked it up a notch and spent eight years teaching these Vaipulya sutras, which typically are meant to include like the Pure Land sutras, the Amitabha sutra, Akshobhya sutra, all these like other Buddhas, other Buddha lands, a lot of times even Vimalakirti Sutra is put in the Vipulya category. Then apparently everybody was ready. Everybody knew there were other Buddhas. Everybody knew it was going to get wild. And then he dropped on them the wisdom, the transcendent wisdom, the Pranya Paramita Sutras. And that took 22 years of unloading those and if you've read those you know they're long it probably took 22 years lot lay all those out and then finally the last eight years of the buddha's life he spent preaching the lotus sutra and the one that he gives on his deathbed the pari nirvana sutra and again that takes eight years and the buddha was supposedly uh left home and enlightened around 35 or so so and lived till he was 80 that doesn't exactly match up with this. And so again, I just want you to know that this is a Chinese tradition. And what you're looking at here is not uh, really an attempt at history. It's an attempt to understand how all of these different teachings fit together. So it's done chronologically, but they were more concerned with how does this giant Avatamsaka Sutra match in with this Four Noble Truth stuff? <laughs> How, this seems really like not the same guy. This seems like not the same teacher. Well, it was, but he laid it out gradually. So that was an idea that Kumar Jiva dropped on the sort of East Asia. Oop, I lost it. Are you? Sorry, folks. Oops. Sorry about that, folks. Kumi, where'd you go, baby? All right. We're back. So that's where we're at now. Apologies for that little delay. So in the fifth, four, one, two, fifth century AD, something new happens. And this is important. And, and I just, this is again, important for the rest of the history of Buddhism. Traditionally in the South of China, this started that, a guy by the name of Bodhidharma around the fifth century. This guy is a very mysterious mythological figure. 
a lot of different reports, but the reports are that he was a Buddhist monk that came from the South. He came via sea. In fact, usually he's depicted, oh, sorry, and he's considered the first patriarch of the Chan or Zen tradition, which I'll explain in a minute. He's traditionally uh, depicted floating on a reed. He supposedly rode a reed all the way from Southern India, not from Sri Lanka, not from Indonesia, but from Southern India. He was a Brahmin originally. And so I put this yellow dot in Southern China at the beginning of the fifth century, because what happened was is that this guy Bodhidharma shows up, but he's from the South. And you know, he's looking wild. He's got wild pierced ears, like a, like a Indian dude. He's often depicted wearing a maroon or deep red robe, which actually makes me think he was Sarvastivadin or Mula Sarvastivadin. Either way, either way if he was it doesn't matter the point is is that he came from southern india bringing with him a very rigorous tradition of seated dhyana meditation classic uh theravadan style classic old school remember sarvastivadins go all the way back remember that line of the Sarvastivans on our timeline. They're a very, very old school of Buddhism. And so whether Bodhidharma was Sarvastivadin, Theravadin, or whatever, he seems to have brought to China this crazy, weird practice of just sitting and doing dhyana, or jhana, as it's called in Pali, doing jhana meditation. And I want you to know, after, hear, after looking at the list of the five periods of the Buddhist teaching, and he's like under the tree for 21 days, preaching the Avatamsaka Sutra, and then he's doing this, and then he's doing that, Buddhism had gotten really wild by the time Kumara Jiva was explaining it to everybody. And so when this guy, Bodhidharma, showed up into China, and he was like, oh, yeah, I just sit. I just sit and meditate. They were just like, wow, that's crazy, dude. And so I'm putting a little brown dot inside that yellow dot this is a whole new thing um if you oh and, and i should mention that the word dhyana uh absorption or deep meditation again in pali it's called jhana sanskrit dhyana well the way the chinese translated it the way bodhidharma taught everybody to translate dhyana was in chinese chana and that eventually just gets reduced to Chan. And so Chan Buddhism and that character Chan is pronounced in Japanese Zen. Zen means dhyana, Chan means dhyana, and Bodhidharma was indeed a dhyana practicing monk. So he brings dhyana practice to Southern China. It starts to become pretty popular during this uh, next two centuries, next 200 years. Um, and I think the most important thing to keep it brief about Bodhidharma and Zen Buddhism is that Bodhidharma or his successors introduced the lineage system to China. And I'm not saying this wasn't existent before Bodhidharma, but what the Zen or Chan tradition is kind of really about is a lineage system, meaning, oh, my teacher is this person whose teacher was that person whose teacher was that person whose teacher was Bodhidharma, who came from India, whose teacher was this person whose teacher was that person whose teacher was that person whose teacher was Shakyamuni Buddha. So the connecting in China of the tradition all the way back to India through a lineage system that connects via Bodhidharma, that's also an element of Zen, lineages. Just pointing that out. Okay, and at this point, folks, you guessed it. I'm not taking questions because we're near the end, so I'm just going to do a nice question and answer at the end. I apologize for the kind of steam barreling, uh, but, it, but honestly, if I stopped for a minute, we would not get to the end of this. So it's at this point that this purple, the purple dot, the purple dot represents uniquely Chinese, or at this point, Sui Dynasty, early Tang Dynasty, 
like Chinese conceptions of what Buddhism is, right? That Chinese conception of what Buddhism is broken into the five periods, that's what goes to Shila. Shila was this uh, uh, kingdom that lasted, a, or um, uh, an empire, I, I apologize, not a kingdom, an empire that lasted a very long time. Very few people are hip to Shila, uh, the, king, the, the empire. It is what we today call Korea or the Korean peninsula. The Buddhism that winds up in Shila in Korea is this Chinese type. Now, of course, it comes through Central Asia, it comes from Kush Valley, it comes from India, but it's been processed through the Chinese language and Chinese culture. And it is from the Korean Peninsula that Buddhism jumps over to Japan. But what Japan gets is this imperial, which is why I put it in purple, by the way, an imperial Korean Chinese form of Buddhism. Uh, for most of like history, Japan was often kind of referred to as Nippon um, or something in a, any, if you were Portuguese or whatever, it sounded something like that. Um, the Japan is a, is a modern pronunciation of that archipelago and the buddhism that was uh there was sort of it, it came over earlier but there was a ruler again a ruler of japan prince shotoku uh, those are his dates he became like a total dharma head he actually even wrote his own commentaries to the lotus sutra um, and so he's kind of credited with really bringing and popularizing buddhism in china or sorry Japan, Nippon, and check his dates, right? So I just want you to see again how far we've come from the time of the Buddha. Uh, this is Prince Shotoku. And really quickly, but without going too far into it, the Japanese, when they got a hold of Buddhism under Prince Shotoku during the Nara period, they understood it as six schools. And what I want you to know is that Buddhism in Japan in the first 100, 200, 300 years, these six schools, they were six think tanks. They were six divisions of a whole Japanese Buddhist church that were like, all right, you figure, you figure out the monastic code. We're going to be over here figuring out the early, early Nikaya Dharma stuff that we found in the Abhidharma. You're going to be over there looking into this emptiness stuff based on an old treatise called the Satya Siddhi Treatise that is like a Theravada emptiness uh, uh, text. Yeah, you guys figure that out. We're going to be over here working on the Nagarjuna stuff, the Madhyamaka school, the Middle Path. Um, you guys figure out how that's all tied together in a mind-only school called Yogacara based on the teachings of not even the buddha but the future buddha maitreya i don't know how that works and then finally the pinnacle of all of this is this avatamsaka inconceivable business you guys figure that out and so again these were six think, think tanks that were trying to figure out this science of buddhism so these were in no way shape or form competing schools these were six divisions of one japanese buddhism trying to figure it out all right. Um, moving ahead again. Whoop, where do we are? Okay. So while this is going on, and while Japan is figuring out the imperial Buddhism of China, the newfangled Zen called Chan, that's popping off on all these like uh, prestigious mountain monasteries. All right. So it's very rural again, focused on meditation. It became a school unto itself. In other words, if you were maybe a Lotus Sutra Buddhist, you were a Lotus Sutra school Buddhist, you, you just chanted the Lotus Sutra and you were really into it, you still might pilgrimage up to one of these mountains to meditate for three months with one of these masters and get some Dharma nuggets. So I want you to understand that that's how, that, how Buddhism was working in China at this time. Now, now we get to Tibet, folks. Note the, note the timeline. We are very, very, very far from the origins of Buddhism. 
the type of Buddhism that goes into Tibet um, is this Mula Sarvastivadin type that was in Nepal. The Tibetan Empire, more or less about the beginning of the 8th century is when it's rising. Of course, there's been people in Tibet who forever were talking about it as a, uh, you know, a world player in empire. And that empire is, insofar as Buddhism came to the empire, that's credited with this monk, uh, a rishi, a seer, a, a, a wild guy named Padmasambhava, the lotus born, sometimes uh, respectively called Guru Rinpoche, the great guru. Uh, this is uh, kind of a statue depiction of, of uh, Padmasambhava. That's a little close up. So he's a kind of wild looking guy, wild looking Buddhist. It's a wild type of Buddhism. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. It's a wild type of Buddhism that makes its way to Tibet. And again, looking at the timeline, oh, and this is the first monastery built in Tibet, uh, traditionally by Padmasambhava. But again, if you look at the timeline, you look at this Buddhism in Nepal has been like just growing and growing and growing and growing and growing for centuries and centuries and centuries. So it's a pretty wild, well-developed type of Buddhism that makes its way into Tibet. That same type of wild, you know, Mula Sarvastivadin, but again, we're very far from the origins of this school. That's what goes to what is today Bhutan, Bangladesh, those regions. Those are all kind of in that same vein of Buddhism. Then at this point, about late 600s, beginning of the 700s, I've made India no longer our... Mahasamgika, good old classic Buddhist. It's kind of an orange color. And I'm just trying to point out that times are changing in India. And what this orange represents kind of is the rise of esoteric or tantric Buddhism. Depending on what scholar you talk to, this is sort of a hybrid of, quote, Hinduism and Buddhism. It's a magical form of, of religion that was that was prevalent throughout the world. You could look at it that way too. Tantrism or esoteric Buddhism is, you know, really steeped in a lot of ritual rites, a lot of art, really Baroque art, things like that. That was all getting really, really popular in India at this time. Eventually India goes pure Tantra. And whether you were quote Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, doesn't matter. It was Tantra. You were chanting mantras, doing magic. It, it's, if you're familiar with esoteric Buddhism, this is the rise of esoteric Buddhism in India, Nepal, and Tibet. All right there. Just want to note that while the esoteric school is growing in India and Tibet and Nepal, the Zen school or Chan school is really getting popular in East Asia, spreading down into Vietnam. I want everybody to know that the Buddhism in Vietnam comes via China and comes via that kind of Bodhidharma style Zen, not the Theravadan of its neighbors. It's just kind of important for the map that even though they're right there, the two are very different in practice. Uh, okay. And now these are, eventually when it's all said and done, these are the eight schools of East Asian Buddhism. This is a schema that is recognized in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, China, you name it. It's kind of a really basic framework. It shouldn't, none of it actually should be a surprise because I've tried to lay out where it came from. Let's start at the bottom real quick. The eighth school is just the tantric or esoteric school of Buddhism, of which there are many, by the way, Shingon, various schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Lineage schools, mostly Zen, but not exclusively Zen, by the way, that are based on meditation, dhyana. The mind-only school, based on Yogacara, is also called the Vijnanavada. The inconceivable school, always based on the Avatamsaka Sutra. Lotus school, based on the Lotus Sutra. In China, this becomes known as the Tiantai, or in Japan, Tendai Buddhism. Pure Land School, based on devotional text, mainly to Amitabha Buddha, the Buddha of infinite light, or infinite life. 
And then the Pranya school based on the emptiness stuff, transcendent wisdom, Pranya. And then, of course, the foundational first school, you got to have a Vinaya, got to have the monastic renunciation. The only thing I want to linger on for a moment here is that in East Asia, the first school, the Vinaya school, that was about uh, ordination, shaving heads, here's your robes, all of that. Now, what school are you going to be a part of? You're going to go study the Avatamsaka Sutra. You want to go study the Lotus Sutra. You're going to go to a mountain monastery and do some Zen. You're going to learn mantras and start doing some magical rites. What do you want to do? But you can't do any of that unless you're ordained. So the first school is not in any way Theravada, anything like that. It's just a school to make sure we're ordaining monastics correctly. Right. Okay. And I am really actually getting close to the end because a lot doesn't change from here on out. This is sort of the foundation. I need to introduce this. I've been very careful not to dive into well world history. You know, like I've said tonight, this is so gr grossly overstated, all of this. But I do need to mention, and I, because a lot of people aren't familiar with chronology of history, like when things happen relative to other things, I want everybody to know that it's, these are the dates for Muhammad, founder of Islam, right? This is in the Arabian Peninsula, way over here. But the Islamic empire, right? So now we're talking the empire. That really doesn't really start rising and getting popular in the regions that we're talking about until about the ninth century, roughly. And it's from that rise of the Islamic empire that you start to get the disappearance of Buddhism and Buddhist practices in, um, well, what is today Afghanistan and Pakistan and why those regions are today mostly Islamic. Um, again, I, these are rough. They're still Buddhist there. They're still Buddhist there today. But this is sort of the beginning of the disappearance of Buddhism, or at least the height of Buddhism under the Gandharans and all of that, right? Um, meanwhile, though, while Islam is heading east, this tantrism, this rise of magical esoteric Buddhism is spreading to Southeast Asia. And that spread is seen most clearly in Java, in this place called Borobudur where they made at some point in the time period that we're looking at now, this giant mandala. This is like peak esoteric Buddhism in Southeast Asia. The reason why I point out this rise of the South, of, of Tantrism in Southeast Asia is because it doesn't last long. Hold on to that idea because the rise of Tantrism also enters into what is today Mongolia, right? So Mongolian Buddhism is very tantric, very esoteric, very much of the flavor of the Tibetan plateau. And that's because, of well, eventually at this time period, also because of the Muslim or Islamic incursions into India, Buddhism begins to disappear from its homeland, surviving in Nepal and surviving in Sri Lanka. I, I mean, surviving in all the other places on the map too, but in terms of its proximity to India, those are the, the places where it survives. I wrote a whole historical novel about the near disappearance of Buddhism in China that happens in the year 845. And if you look at the timeline, we're basically looking at the year 845. Again, history is too long and too complex, but it's at this point that Buddhism basically disappears from China, except for those few little mountain monasteries that I've kept on my little dots. But I've kept them as little dots because at this point in China, Buddhism was, well, not that it wasn't always considered a foreign religion, but it almost reached the level of a child. It almost reached the level of a, of a hometown player. And then again, bunch of historical things that I'm avoiding talking about. Buddhism disappears and these little pockets of that weird foreign religion Buddhism, mostly Chan or Zen, are what survive in China. 
uh, at this point. This is Central Asia, but actually what I'm trying to show you on the map, again, if we were gonna do a political map, is that this would be the kind of an empire at this point. This is the beginning of the rise of a, well, it's complicated in terms of the Tibetans, the Uyghur, Mongolians, um oh my gosh there's a whole region and world of people going on here that don't they don't get any chapters in the history books in elementary school right but this uh empire is what eventually kind of moves us into the year a thousand all right it's oh and right now about the year a thousand india moves back to the good old form we're not doing any of that funky monkey, magical, esoteric stuff anymore. And I, as a scholar, sort of would just throw in here, this is when you can start talking about Theravada Buddhism, the way of the elders. And I would argue that they're talking about none of the esoteric stuff that's been popular the last few hundred years. We're going back to the old ways. So again, I would suggest that Theravada could be traced back to around now. Mm, that the early stuff was all precursor to what would become Theravada. Boom, I don't know if you just saw what happened at the top, but I pulled an in, inconceivable liberation on you and I shrunk <laughs> the time. And so we have a thousand years of history to do. But again, it doesn't really take that much. There's one, basically one more world player you have to know about. As we move ahead to the year uh, or to the middle of the 1200s, boom, the whole esoteric tantric thing takes over China, Mongolia, Tibet, everywhere via mainly this guy. Again, I'm, I'm condensing world history, but Kublai Khan this um, founder of the Yuan dynasty. The Yuan dynasty was, it's a dynasty of Chinese history, but this is the period when the Mongols ruled China. I don't know if you've ever heard this expression, when the Mongols ruled China. It was now, and this is when Kublai Khan created, so what you see in red, minus uh, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Nepal, so minus uh this side of the himalayas everything red on that side that's the un that was a major dynasty this is the dynasty of genghis khan these are the khan the khanates the kagans as they're called and really really quickly folks just like ajatasattu just like ashoka just like kanishka just like every all of these rulers the khans the k-h-a-n the khans Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan, they weren't Buddhist, although they were though. And the thing about this esoteric tantric style Buddhism, again, I would love to spend all night talking about this. That type of Buddhism um, anointed and ordained emperors, khans, you name it, rulers. And so these radical, these really wild magical rites and, and special ordinations, not ordinations as a monastic, but ordinations into celestial uh, lineages. This was all part of the esoteric tradition of which this period of history, again, it's not just the Mongolians, it's not, it's like the whole world, Europe at this point was like magical crazy. And so I just want to tie that all together. Uh, this is Kublai Khan, the founder of the dynasty, the founder of this giant empire. And if we look real quickly, uh, bah, 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 um, on my timeline there, I'm just showing you that this now well-established Theravada tradition is growing concurrently with this esoteric tantric tradition in Asia. But the Zen tradition, that Chan Bodhidharma Zen tradition is being held down in Vietnam, Korea, Japan, and little pockets in China. So just hold on to that because as we jump ahead, uh, moving ahead in history to the about 1400, 
about 1400 the mm, oh, oh man all these names get terrible the chinese you know it's hard to call them the chinese at this point but the chinese sort of around this time start to sort of take back over that area sort of push back the mongols right we're talking great wall of china type you know type stuff so the mongolians they stay esoteric the tibetans they stay esoteric nepal bangladesh bhutan all those areas right meanwhile theravada zen's moving right along and boom we did it we entered into the 21st century we're looking at a buddhist map of the late 20th century moving into the 21st century basically what you have is is that you have this theravada tradition preserved in the countries that are that turmeric orange you have the zen or chan tradition preserved in those brown areas vietnam korea japan with little pockets in in china mainland china and then those esoteric traditions and now you know where they all came from too and just to point out really quickly this is our theravada monk rocking his turmeric robes this is our tibetan monk rocking his saffron sarvastivadin vinaya robes and then would you look at that that is a japanese shingon monk rocking his yellow turmeric outer robe with his dharma guptika black robe but i would also argue that if you sat down with that monk he could tell you how he was ordained. He would talk your ear off about emptiness. He's very devoted, devotional to a particular Buddha. He knows his Lotus Sutra. He knows his Avatamsaka Sutra. He knows all about the mind only school. He definitely does dhyana and has a lineage and a master, a Roshi of some sort in a Zen tradition. And I guarantee you he's doing esoteric tantric rites. So in Japan, in Korea, in China, they're preserving this complex, um, in, you know, tapestry of these A types of Buddhism. And that, folks, is <laughs> the geography of Buddhism coming at you from 10 directions. Okay. I'm going to attempt to not share my screen anymore. Hello. I have a question about the renunciant. Yep. Can you see me all fine? Because my screen got all weird. No, so I'm I all good? Okay. Great. So now I'm on the nice, beautiful grid and I can see everybody. Okay. The renunciants. Talk to me. So it seems as though there's one main school that's renunciant and then the rest are secular, allowing householders. Like, how is that working? Hmm. Um, so that was a lot of information. One of the things I was trying to kind of show the threads of is that there was, there was once upon a time, 18 different renunciatory schools in India. They were, they had, if you remember that brief moment where there were the 18 schools, this was like, you know, 250 BC. Uh -huh. Each of those 18 schools represented a Vinaya tradition, a unique renunciatory path. And the, there's a slight differences of their renunciations, but the, the main obvious difference is the color robes they wear, mm -hmm. right? That the Dharma Guptikas wore black, Sarvastivadins maroon, and the Theravadins or the Staviravadins, they wore the more turmeric. It would, it would be wild to actually get into those 18 schools and parse them out. But the one thing I wanted everybody to walk away from today knowing is that there are essentially three Vinayas active in the world. There's actually, there's more than that. But in terms of the big chunky blocky history I just gave you, you can be ordained in the Theravada tradition and they'll give you some turmeric colored robes and you're off in that tradition. Or you can go to Nepal or Tibet and get ordained in a Mula Sarvastivadin Vinaya way, and they'll give you the saffron robes and 
maybe a Vajra too and some other stuff. Or you can go to Japan or a few other places in East Asia and get ordained in the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya. And they'll give you a set of black robes or brown robes usually. And depending on the school, they'll have a very cool uh, outer robe. So those are the existing renunciatory traditions. It gets really complicated in Buddhism because it's like the renunciatory tradition is just one layer. Yeah. And then the sutra that you're interested in might create another layer. Uh -huh. And then who your teacher or your lineage is, that creates yet an even another layer. So what does that have to do with like the Chen version of Tai Chi? Is that Oh, I mean, again, I, I, um, I always have to drop so much information from these talks, so I'm glad you asked that. That crazy guy Bodhidharma with the big eyes and the pierced ears that came from southern India, well, he's traditionally, he's given credit with having brought also a form of martial art, and Bodhidharma is given the credit with founding the Shaolin kung fu tradition of china uh -huh. but also the tai chi within buddhism is usually a bodhidharma thing mm -hmm. something happens where bodhidharma becomes like um any kind of new chinese inventions of like it was a koan the the crazy sayings oh yeah it was bodhidharma uh the whatever you know whatever uh, uh, meditating with your nose two inches from the wall oh yeah that was bodhidharma so bodhidharma gets credited with everything but you should know in regards to your question, he also gets credited with bringing that kind of martial art. Interesting, thank yep. you. Yep. You're very knowledgeable about this. I really appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here to provide. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. Anybody else? Yo par Param. Parham. I, think, I, think, I feel like I have lots of questions, but it's good that I'm stuck at home with the internet. I can check in on some of it myself. But I think the one, maybe the one thing that I want to ask you is <clears throat> like in the period between the sixth century and I guess the 10th century when the spread of Islam was happening in Western Asia, were there any, I guess my question is like, were there any historical instances that kind of made it into the history books of note of Buddhism spreading west past Afghanistan, mm. maybe like into Iran or into <clears throat> Tajikistan or those areas? Yep. Um, yeah, there's, um, yeah, that's, it's, um, it, wow, it's a very, it's a great question, very complicated, it makes it even more complicated because I, I consider myself a, um, a medievalist, which means I, I don't know a lot about ancient history. And you might have noticed, I don't know a lot about kind of uh, more modern history, like 14th, 15th, 16th century stuff. But you put me right in that medieval period. And I got too much to say. So there's, there's two things that I want to, yeah, yeah, I'll actually I'll just say it to one thing. There's a very famous um, uh, battle with a Chinese general around like four... I forget when it was, 480, 580, right around that period. And there's been a few uh, papers that have been written about this battle because he got to this point. And a lot of people say that basically had he kept going, Buddhism would have spread further uh, west. But there's, and then the people wonder like this about a lot of historical moments of like, but why, why didn't he? And I'm not going to dive into why he did or he didn't, but there was this moment when it looked like Buddhism could have, but then it didn't. And then, yeah, you kind of, but yeah, it's a very interesting question. Cool. Really. Thanks. I'll check into it further. Thanks yeah, for yeah, yeah. Talk. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? We have a Michael. question in, in oh. the chat, Michael. I don't know if you can see it. Chat. Oh my gosh, um, it says, a chat. yeah. Something about how indigenous. Oh my God. An another thing I dropped out entirely, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, like the bond in Tibet. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like a whole other talk, which was like, 
you know, you know, uh, in Photoshop when you select inverse. <laughs> so I selected the Buddhism. We could select the inverse and give you the talk that's about kind of Hinduism in India, a bone in Tibet, Taoism in China, Shinto in Japan. I can't do it though. Yeah, and it's what makes each um it's it's sort of a a it's it's the exact kind of actually uh, beautiful question that leads to another hour talk which is how when buddhism goes to china and mixes with taoism and gets understood in terms of taoism that leads to kind of a whole unique chinese form of buddhism and when buddhism goes to japan and mixes with shinto um, there's this great, a great book uh, called The Fox and the Jewel. This is a great book about Japanese religion. Not Buddhism, not Shinto, but Japanese religion. Um, and the, fo the jewel is kind of a Buddhist thing, but the fox is like a Shinto a deity, kami. Anyways, my point was that when you get into Buddhism in Japan, it's unique because of that Shinto underneath it. Same thing in China. Tibetan Buddhism is so wild because of that bone tradition underneath it. So yeah, again, a whole other talk um, to Aunt, was it Anne who asked the question? Great question. Again, I apologize for not really being able to give that all that justice, so. Okay. All right. Um, any other question, questions? Somebody started to say one earlier. Hmm? So you got it all. Hey, Michael, may I? Yeah, of course, that's what I'm here yeah. for. Yeah, cool. Well, it's not a question, it's more like a recommendation of this book that I finished this week. Hmm. Uh, it's written by this guy named MC <laughs> Owens. And I want to recommend it because uh, I'm not a big uh, history fan, but I'm so into geography and Dharma, of course. And it, it, I don't even want to say the plot, but I want to recommend it to all because it's fascinating. It's almost like a Dharma fan service. Imagine that. There's so many elements of Dharma, so many types of uh, schools that coalesce in a point of history. Uh, they share their uh, sutras, there's everything. There's like uh, visions of Buddha lands, there's the teacher disciple relationship, so many things happening that if you're a Dharma head like me, you're gonna love this book. So <laughs> it's a great recommendation. And it was obviously written by Michael, and as, as I said, I don't know about history that much, but it's apparently really well researched. Like the last pages are <laughs> all just bibliography. So I assume he, Michael did his homework really, really, really well. So it's a total recommendation. Thanks for that plug, Eric. I appreciate that. Yeah, and of course this talk, uh, I, I referenced that book really briefly, but yeah, I mean, it, I'm trying to capture a lot of that excitement about medieval period Buddhism and how beautifully diverse it was and trying to write it in that little piece of historical fiction. So thanks for that. And actually on that note, really quickly, if you're interested in the 18 schools, the early, early stuff, this is the book to get. Uh, let's see. Yep. Buddha schools of the small vehicle by Bajo. There. So this is the best book for early Buddhism, like the early, early stuff. And like, what do we know? What can we know? All of that. What are the debates? I always recommend Paul Williams. Yeah, Paul Williams books. These two, uh, basic Buddhism, sorry, basic Buddhist thought, like just the basics of Buddhism. This is such a good book for just like, the origins and the basics of Buddhism in India, but also a little bit of how it spread. If you're more into all of the more Mahayana stuff, he wrote a sequel. This gets more into the Gandharan, Central Asian and Chinese stuff. A lot of my talk tonight focused on the rise of Tantrism, the rise of the esoteric tradition. 
if you're interested in that, I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, the Indian esoteric, uh, Indian esoteric Buddhism, a social history of the tantric movement by Ronald Davison. Oh my God, the Mahasiddhas and like, I learned so much about history and India and everything and Buddhism, like such cool Buddhism stuff from this book. And then if anybody's really interested in like full on East Asian, uh, like Buddhism, you got to check out, uh, this is the weaving of mantra and the glare on that by Ryochi Abe, A-B-E is the guy's last name. This is like the resource. And this is, uh, this book, even though this is about like 10 years of Japanese history, and like that's it, you'll, you could learn everything about a lot from reading this book. It's like, it's one of those books that's about a lot more than it's supposedly about. And this book is about a lot more than supposedly it's about. So highly recommend those. Do that. If there's nothing else, um, I got a quick one. Yeah, please. Do you have a uh, a recommendation on the on the Himalayan region? You know, I knew somebody was going to ask that, and the reason why I don't. So there's one book by Shambhala called The Vajra World, I believe it's called. I've lost two copies of that to generosity, and um, it used to be my go-to one. It wasn't my favorite though. It, it was still a little, here's the, okay. I was gonna say this if anybody asked. I wasn't gonna say it if nobody asked, but you asked. So, you know, Tibetan Buddhism's kind of tricky. It's tricky to understand and learn. It's, um, you know, quite complex and all of that, but it's also one of those things that, well, it's, what can I say? The, like the books that I just showed you, very academic, very scholarly. The people that wrote those books, like some are Buddhist, some are not, but they don't really have an agenda in uh, uh, um, um, that kind of conversion, try to convert you to their type of Buddhism. What I mean to say is I have yet to find a really nice academic book about the history of Tibetan Buddhism that doesn't have sectarian privilegings. If mm. that makes so I, I read a bunch of them, but I'm always hesitant to be like, oh yeah, read this one because I know that one's only from a very particular school's point of view. Yeah. And I really liked the Vajra World book. Uh I believe that was the title. I can't remember the author, but I liked it because it came the closest to sort of being like, here's all the different schools of Tibetan Buddhism, here's when they started, here's what they basically their differences and similarities and all of that. So I'd recommend that one as of right now. And, you know, Robert Thurman, of course, the authority on kind of Tibetan Buddhism that way. So you could listen to hundreds of hours of lectures on, uh, from him. So. All right, folks, if that's it. Thank you, I'm, Michael. Ah, uh, thank you all again for being thank here. Thank you. <laughs> And you guys know what I'm going to say, but I'll say some different version of it, maybe. Um, so the the collective was started uh, like a year and a half ago uh, on a few foundational principles, one of which is that the Dharma uh, should be accessible to everybody and there should never be a financial barrier between people who want to hear the Dharma and the Dharma. Uh, and a year and a half later, we're still going based on that principle um but that only works if people who can donate donate so that people who aren't able to donate can be there um can be here in this in this buddha field with all of us on the internet so please donate if you can um if you can't keep coming back and keep hanging out everyone's welcome always and um i assume everyone here knows but just in case you don't this this background that uh, I'm fading into is part of the Vimalakirti Sutra, and we're running a series now where on Sunday night, uh, Michael Owens will read from the Sutra and talk about it. And then on Thursday night, Michael Taft is just pulling these guided meditations 
from somewhere under the jeweled net <laughs> and is doing these guided meditations that complement the passage that we just read from the sutra in a way that is pretty wild. Um, so if you've been missing that, you can catch up on our YouTube channel and then join us on Sunday. It's great to be here with you all and uh, please donate and thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody. And Jaswal, you're hilarious with the Kumar Jiva. <laughs> hilarious.